Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Every week, we go live with a film professional to discuss their current work. And this week, I'm joined by re recording mixer and supervising sound editor Michael Minkler, uh, who, whose work includes Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Chicago, Black Hawk Down, and most recently, Greyhound. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I guess my first question for you for Greyhound, which um, has been doing really well uh, for Apple TV is, so in most cases, whenever I talk to sound people, you know, they'll be working on something that they can easily, you know, recreate the sound of. So it's a BMW car, just go find a BMW car, get that car. But in something like this, where most of the destroyers, uh, you know, a lot of them got destroyed in World War II and a lot of them are docked as museums now. So how did you guys go about figuring out what it would sound like on these uh, machines? Well, first of all, you, um, th there was a, um, an edict from the uh, filmmakers that they wanted this to be as authentic as possible. <clears throat> so one would think that you just, okay, get some recordings and or go out and record your own material and use that. Well, that doesn't, uh, we are making a movie, so that doesn't really fly as, as far as you would think it would. Mm -hmm. But we always start off with something authentic. We will start, in this case, it was starting with the library sound effects because um, there are libraries of all of this uh, weaponry, of uh, the, the ships themselves. Um, so then it's, it's up to us to, uh, to create something that's a little more entertaining. And uh, you know the sound designer, sound designers get a hold of the material of the guns, and they sweeten them, and they sweeten them with anywhere from two to ten tracks on every single shot. So, um, so as to help, you know, create the illusion that we're there. First of all, recordings, live recordings of this type of stuff aren't really that impressive anyway because they had to be recorded from a distance, and in the filming of a movie. We're literally feet away. We're you know five, 10, 15 feet away from these massive guns. So uh, no recording could um, uh, give that its proper due. So we have to create it. It's, it's we choose how big, how special we want to make it. And then we just go with that. And it changes throughout the film. Uh, obviously, the, well, the guns stay pretty much exactly the same way that we in, in initiated them to be. But then they're tailored on a shot for shot basis a little bit throughout to help uh, with the storyline. It's interesting that you say that, because uh, I always think about if you hear a real gun versus what you hear in a movie, like you said, it's sort of sweetened and improved upon. Were there other things in the film that you had to, I guess, uh, make more entertaining for us? Oh, sure, everything. Um, <laughs> when you're on board a ship, um, in this movie, when we are on board the ship, we want to be able to hear the engines. Okay, so uh, whether the authenticity of hearing that engine from the bridge versus hearing that engine from down the control center might be different. Uh, we, we did our version of different. When it comes to the ocean and the waves and the bow wash, and the, the, just the, to, to help emphasize the violence of the, of the ocean and the coldness of the air, um, it, where, the, where the water became icy, uh, you know, that's, that's just to our taste that we have to create that with you know, hundreds of, of sound effects in order to create that illusion. Uh, again, real recordings wouldn't really, wouldn't really work uh, dramatically. They will work as a blueprint. They'll give you an idea of what certain things would sound like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, we, we follow that, but we do it to our taste. Everything is done to our taste. Um, so it's the ships, it's the ocean, it's the well, uh, the, the bow wash, the waves, um, all the armory, the, the submarine sounds, the torpedo sounds. Those are pretty greatly exaggerated um, because 
you're not going to hear a torpedo from the surface mm -hmm. necessarily, but we wanted to just because it felt like the right thing to do. We've mixed it without the, hearing the torpedo from the surface, but uh, we like it better with it. Well, what's interesting about that, <clears throat> like I think about the torpedo and I remember when I was just getting into film, someone gave me a book and it was like how they created different, different sounds for different films. And they went to the hunt for the broad October and there was a whole chapter on just the torpedoes. So how did you guys create the torpedoes since we don't really know what that sounds like and you know, you wanted to give the audience that, that feeling of it sort of rushing through the water. Yeah, I think in um, Hunt for Red October, the, the torpedoes were pretty predominantly featured where we were in the water with the torpedo, as I recall. So they used, um, uh, they had the advantage of being able to hear the whirring of the of the propellers mm -hmm. and the movement of this you know pretty large piece of equipment through lots of water um and and then to, to do it in, in a dramatic sense our torpedoes are mostly just shot out from underneath you only hear you only see so therefore you only hear uh the expulsion of the torpedo out of the submarine, mm -hmm. the U-boat. The other times that we see the torpedoes, we're on, uh, we are above water. And that's what I said, you, you're not gonna hear it yeah. uh, in, real, in, in reality. But we tried to keep um, it alive with using a whirring sound that was constantly getting closer to where it's pitching, 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 pitching up as it gets closer. It's dramatic may not be correct. Um, yeah. we, we have a, a, a moment where it, where one, you know, misses the, the ship and it has this horrific squeal as it goes by. Uh, we have another one that actually hits the hull of the ship, but at such an angle, it doesn't explode. It instead ricochets. Yeah. Off. And so um, I, that's just a, a recreation uh, or, or not a recreation. It's a creation of our own what would that sound like? What would it be? And how scary should that be? Um, we are dealing with fear at all times. That's one of the high points of this movie is that uh, these ships, once they hit that zone in the Atlantic, they've got 400 or so miles to go where they're uncovered by, uh, by aircraft. So they're on their own. They're trying to make it through there as fast as possible. They know they're being hunted by dozens of U-boats. So it's constant fear. It's 48 hours or so of constant fear. You, are not, you cannot relax. You cannot uh, let your guard down. You're going to get shot at uh, or your other ships that they're trying to protect are gonna get shot at. Um, it's a life and death situation for those 48 hours. How, um because it is a life and death situ situation. And, you know, one of the things I've heard from um, people who actually experienced World War II and, and going through it is how much um, Hollywood sounds real to them. Like when they see a film, it's, that's what it was like. It feels and sounds like that. So, you know, you have that sort of exaggeration, but do you go in and try and make it, like, I guess, how do you get that balance so that you can make someone feel like they're actually experiencing what's actually happened. Well, there are some movies where you do want absolute authenticity. Yeah. Uh, like, well, they're usually quieter places, places that you can control. Uh, a jail cell, for instance, um, a forest, um, where, where the, the reality of the sound itself is the character, is the fear. And you're not going to you're not going to uh, move too far away from that reality. It's the heightened reality that you would get out of a World War II movie, because again, uh, we can't make those gunshots and those explosions as loud as they actually would be. And believe me, I've had directors and actors show up on a mix stage and say, you know, things like. 
I was there when that went off, when that explosion went off. It was 10 times louder than that. Make it 10 times louder. And I go, I can't. That's not, <laughs> not possible in this world that I live in of, of, of cinema. But I can give you the best that we can do. But they were right. I mean, it's not real. It's not authentic. But it's the best of our version of, of authentic and, and uh, um, something that would scare you. Is there a scene or a moment in this film that um, you felt like, or you were most proud of the work you did on it? Wow. Uh, I don't think so. I, I think it was all, it was just, it was a ride from the beginning when the first encounter um, on radar, uh, the ship, and then um, a U-boat. And then when it ends is when the air cover finally does arrive because they've gotten close to the English uh, uh, um, coast. Um, the, it's like, you know, the cavalry has come to save them. Um, so the, the, uh, the air cover arrives. So for, it's the whole time. So there's nothing, any one of those circumstances, it's all of them. We had to make every one of them really tense. Um, we had to you know, calm down a little bit here and there because you can't keep that level of intensity up that long, but you know, it's always, it's tense the whole time. So I, there isn't really any one thing, no, sorry. Now we have a message from uh, a person watching and that's from uh, David Forth says he, he worked on the previs for the film. And that makes me wonder, um, now how much are you seeing, because a lot of times now editing and sound are working almost at the same time now. Um, so were you getting previous uh, cuts with previous shots in it? And how do you figure out uh, what you want that moment to sound like when it's not the finalized uh, effect in there? Okay, well, the previous happened uh, way before I got involved or Warren Shaw got involved or anyone else, um, we saw some of the previs uh, in the cutting room. It just gave us a general overall effect. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until um, about two months after production that enough temporary visual effects shots came in that gave us the idea of the, a much closer idea of what it was going to look like. Um, and we thought at that time, okay, we can start working on this. Um, and that took us through the first mix of the film, but then the film was, went away. And the film went away and, and when it came back, it had a whole new set of visual effects, uh, hundreds of different visual effects because the film got uh, uh, conceived a, li a little bit differently um, by Tom Hanks. And uh, he took it, he just, you know, bigger and bolder. So a lot of the visual effects changed. So what we had done before was only working so much. It, everything had to be changed again. But we had something good to work with uh, from that first pass, I wouldn't say, but, it, but previs, all the way back to previs, doesn't really help us other than, at least not in this case, um, previs in a science fiction movie where they're actually creating alien creatures or other creatures that are going to be walking, talking, whatever it is, um, that previs is very valuable to us. And, and the sound guys can actually work with the visual effects people through the director. And, and, and they, the two things can live side by side it can, and can mature the soundtrack or the voice, let's say, of the character and, and the uh, visual of the character can grow together in, the, in a previous situation early on. And then of course, keep growing and growing as the uh, elements get better and better into play. But this, this previous, previous um, 
you know, was the ships, it was the explosions, it was the, the chase, it was the convoy. It was just to give us, all it did for us in this particular movie was give us a rough idea of what we were gonna be faced with. Now I have a question from Samantha and she wants to know, um, Tom Hanks wrote this film and he's also directed several things. Was he involved in the creative process from making decisions or was it left up to the, the director for sound? Uh, okay. Tom, Tom was not hands-on on the sound. Uh, he, we played him our mixes. He had comments. We played them many times for him. We would play them in short form, uh, you know, short in real form or in the whole movie form. And, but he would just come in now and then as the producer, he wanted to see the growth. Uh, as far as how things evolved in this, within the context of the soundtrack was pretty much guided by, uh, well, was, it, the, the editing room. Let's just call it the editing room. Mm -hmm. Gary Getzman and, and uh, uh, Mark Krzyzewski, um, they planned the film inside the cutting room, as did Aaron previously, or mm -hmm. the director, Aaron. Um, so the, the editing room, the editing room provided for us ideas, but then those ideas had to be, we, um, we had to figure out how to do those ideas. And that was Warren and, and myself and the team of uh, sound designers, mm -hmm. um, a team of dialogue editors, because a lot of the film is dialogue, um, is a constant, you know, they're under fire for the whole length of the movie, practically. And yeah. so it's under combat situation. There's a lot of talking going on. There's a lot of orders being given and, and commands being returned. So there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a whole level of anxiety and tension that's just with the dialogue. And then there's, you know, then you throw in the, the sound effects and the music, and you get three full levels of audio that are telling this story. Um, we shared all of those ideas back into the cutting room, and the cutting room would come back to us. Uh, Tom saw things in the cutting room, of course. Uh, so the, there was always a give and a take and a give and a take um, the, the whole way. Uh, we could do anything we wanted until somebody didn't like it. <laughs> but that's kind of the case all the time. Yeah. Now I have Emily Liu wants to know, um, what are some of your favorite films this season? So this past year because of COVID uh, and what have you watched while you're not working? She kind of stole one of my ending questions. So. <laughs> well, well, that's not putting me on the spot now, is it? <laughs> Maybe, maybe well, I have a couple of favorites, and those would be Mank, okay, and uh, the Trial of the Chicago Seven. Um, I also liked Soul, the animated movie. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not say I didn't like the other ones, but those are the ones that stick in my mind that I really enjoyed. And it was great filmmaking. For Mank, were you a fan of uh, Citizen Kane before? Well. Not really. I mean, I've seen I've seen it two three times. Uh, I I'm not as big a fan as other people are. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously a great movie. Uh, Orson Welles, I'm not that big of a fan of either. But it doesn't mean I don't like or appreciate what happened, in the making of that movie, particularly yeah. in the time when it, when it was made. Oh my God! <laughs> See, I, I give a lot of credit to films that that did something that's never been done before. They did something so early on using their wit because they didn't have the technology or in some cases creating technology to, to en enhance their wit. Um, and, and certainly Citizen Kane has to be 
on a pedestal when it comes to that mm -hmm. um, consideration. Um, and I loved watching Mank being a film buff. I, I liked that story playing out it, in a dramatic way. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not truth to every single thing that was said in that movie, but uh, I enjoyed it a lot as if it was true. I mean, it, it just, I, those, those were a bunch of characters back then. And uh, I really appreciate the early days of film where people where almost everything was new. Everything was imagination. Uh, today, we are, there's so much history and there's so much creativity done already. Uh, have, we have so many tools, we have so much technology. It's like, what's new? Well, it's very hard to find anything new. Um, even though technology is growing and growing and growing leaps and bounds every single year. Those are, that's what I would call the new things. But back then in the thirties, everything was new. How you made a movie in general, every single way, everything, everything that needed to be done in order to make a movie, they had to invent. And it's, yeah. um, gosh, but those are great stories. Well, it would have been so exciting to be back then and just be like, Let's try it. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And, oh, you yeah. Know, you know, see what works. There's a very famous uh, uh, sound director named Douglas Shearer, yeah. who uh, was at MGM. And he's got he's credited with over a thousand movies because he took the credit on all the movies. Um, and he basically, it, there, there's an autobiography of him. Um, he was the brother of Norman, Norma Shearer who was, uh, I believe in, in Make, was one of the characters in Make. And um, also uh, uh, she was married to um, uh, uh, Thalberg, Irving mm -hmm. Thalberg. And it was very casual uh, meeting at, of some sort that, you know, because of Norma being married to Irving and Irving met Douglas, her brother, you know, um, socially. And Douglas was a techno guy. And this was before sound actually happened. And he said, you know, hey, you want sound? I can get you sound. I can figure this out. I'm sure I might, I'm simplifying this tremendously. <laughs> but uh, he would basically, Irving Faber gave Douglas Shearer the green light. Go invent sound of how do we apply it to motion pictures. Yeah. So it's production recordings, it's, on, it's musical recordings, it's recordings uh, uh, you know, on the sets and the, with these giant sets and elaborate musical things. And, and then how do you re-record? How, how do you make it into a movie in the end? I mean, all of these things, they had to invent it. Yeah. And that's a that's what he's one of the greatest stories ever, it's Douglas Shearer. Wow. Now, I have one last question that I like to ask everyone. Um, and Emily kind of took part of that question. So I'm going to alter it now because you said you're a film buff. Is there a film that everyone should check out that you think uh, is one of the greatest films that people aren't talking about or aren't aware of or mm. should be aware of? Yeah, but I doesn't really come to mind. I or what's what I guess what is a um, what is one of your favorite classic films that film buffs should know about? Oh, God, I appreciate complex filmmaking. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that simple movies I don't like, little talkies or little road trips or something uh, you know, in small in scale can be an amazing movie. But the ones that I really appreciate personally are the ones that have layers and layers and layers of complex, uh, complexity, that um, complexity in, um, in the, the writing, the, the production design, 
the camera work, the direction, the sound, uh, the editing. I mean, there's there's some textbook movies out there that this is how you make a movie. You know, yeah. it, this is a goal is to try and and I would put Mink as as one of those kinds of movies in my book that just has all of that thing, all of that stuff working for it. It can be so, so admired by someone like me, uh, whereas other people may not understand the story, so they kind of dismiss the, the film. Where in this particular case, I just think it's 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 so dense with so much great stuff. So um, a movie like The Godfather is just is like that. It's so dense. Yeah. There's uh, and some of that density isn't even that obvious because in the movie they're lying so much. Once you figure out that they're every, that everybody in the movie is lying, uh, it makes it even more dense. That <laughs> you know, that's that's the gangster way. Yeah. Um, so it's those kinds of movies. I'm sorry if I can't come no, up with a problem. title. Both are great, right? Like, no, both are no, great no. films. Uh, and one movie I can I can say it in maybe a selfish way is is JFK, and it's layers of density. Uh, mm -hmm. There's almost three stories going on at the same time throughout the entire movie. Yeah. And um, it, it just, uh, there's just so much to it. There's just, there's so many people, characters, stories, locations. Uh, it just keeps moving and moving and moving and moving. And, and, and oh my God, how do you put all of those pieces together? But that, that movie's got, tens of thousands of pieces and every one of them is brilliant and yeah, you put it together and make one movie so that's one i could i could say that for me you know i my, i touched it and yeah. uh, and it's one that i can relate to on that level well thank you so much for letting me interview you today um and uh, i hope you have a, a good week well thank you very much and you have a good week too thanks okay have a good one bye, bye.